this is the start of a very important sequence of videos, which is perhaps the most important part of a chapter eight. And this relates to the section two of chapter eight. And what we're doing is looking at uniform circular motion. Now, hopefully you recall that we did that already. We did uniform circular motion back in chapter four. Now we are thinking about the forces involved. So this is going to focus on the uniform circular motion. A separate section in the future will actually be looking at non-uniform circular motion. But this is very foundational for many types of problems. And if you felt like the uh, information before just about acceleration was a little bit confusing with circular motion, I hope that this will now make more sense once we can actually talk about forces. So. I really boiled this down to two main goals that are hugely important for this video. One is using the RTZ coordinate system. So we discussed in the previous section that anytime your forces in X and Y are related, things get hugely complicated. In a circular motion situation, X and Y are not a good coordinate system to use anymore. That we use this other coordinate system and now we can talk about independent directions of the forces. Next, we're going to be relating forces to centripetal acceleration. So remember, centripetal acceleration was that uh, inward directed acceleration that actually led to uniform circular motion. Now we get to talk about where that's coming from, and the answer is forces. So what are those forces and how do we go about calculating this? So many learning outcomes that this is uh, related to. A big one is, again, representing that we are adding a whole new coordinate system. And this is definitely the coordinate system you want to use whenever you're doing circular motion problems. So anytime you are setting up your problem and drawing a visual representation of it, whether that's a free body diagram, a motion diagram, or just a sketch of the situation, you should define what coordinate system you're using. And if that is the RTZ one, you need to make that very clear. Um, don't just write down variable names and assume that it's clear what coordinate system you've used. The second is problem solving. That if you try to tackle these problems in the X, Y, Z coordinate system, specifically X, Y, the math there is going to be close to impossible. Not actually impossible, but way harder than it needs to be. So a big part of the problem solving here is going from your free body diagram into Newton's second law in a way that you can actually calculate it. Uh, lastly is communicating. That again, when we're talking about what does it mean for something to be radial versus something to be tangential, we mean something specific by it. When we refer to a central force or we refer to centripetal acceleration, we mean something very specific. So I know that memorizing terminology is not something that we typically do in physics as much as some other classes, but this is a case where it's really important that you understand certain types of notation and certain words that we're using. So let's jump into it. What is this new coordinate system? So the RTZ coordinate system is telling you your three components. That's like saying X, Y, Z. And if you call it RTZ, that's absolutely OK, too. So there's one thing that I'm going to point out here, but let's first look at this picture to see what's happening. The radial component is actually towards the center of your circle. The T stands for tangential, right? So R is for radial. T is for tangential, and then Z is for the third one, <laughs> um, which in this picture it says out of the page. So typically we're not going to worry about Z, though it kind of depends. So Z is perpendicular, right? So it's perpendicular to your circle, as you can probably see better down here. So here we actually see the circle, so Z is coming right at us. Here we're seeing the edge of the circle, and now we can clearly see Z. But now the tangential direction is actually into the page. Now there's one thing that I want to mention here, and that is that the book's notation uses the radial component towards the center. One could choose for the radial component to actually be away from the center. And I 
think that that's actually chosen in a lot of other uh, books. So this is something to be careful about. If you're thinking about polar coordinates or cylindrical coordinates, we usually define the radial direction to be away from the center. The book is using the convention that positive radial direction is towards the center. Now, your problems will still work if you define the positive radial direction away from the center. I'm going to do my best to always use the book convention uh, for clarity. However, the most important thing is that you define your coordinate system. You can use it in a different way as long as you've made it really clear to me what you're doing. So the other thing that might not be clear from this picture is that your coordinate system is actually traveling with the particle. So if I consider the second particle, I'm not actually using the same R to Z as the first one, right? Number two. Number two now, this direction is tangential. This direction is radial. And I put my little hats on there. And then Z is again out of the page. Number three here, I have a tangential direction forward a radial direction towards the center, and z is again out of the page. We're normally not going to worry about z unless you have a problem where you need to, and we will talk about some of those later. But again, the important thing to stress is that you make it clear what coordinate system you're using, and you remember that it turns with your particle. So depending on what orientation you draw, it might be more or less clear. So again, the book's showing two different orientations, a top view and a side view. And so in this case, you can see Z and R very clearly. Here you could see R and the T for tangential very clearly. For some problems, we do have forces in Z. For other problems, we don't. So you might want to draw both of these if you have forces where uh, this one specifically forces in Z, this one specifically tangential forces, um, but there's no harm in drawing both of them. So that's the coordinate system. So a long list of reminders. You should always draw your coordinate systems at the beginning of the problem. Define what coordinate system you're using. And there might be cases where you actually use more than one, but you relate them to each other. That's fine. But you must draw and define it. Don't just use the convention of the book and assume that that's clear. Because again, you might be referencing other textbooks or other online uh, resources that actually use different conventions. So please make sure that you explicitly show what coordinate system you're using. You should be using the same coordinate system throughout the problem. Don't switch to having your radius, your radial unit vector point from the inside to the outside of the circle. Don't do that. Again, you might want to use the RTZ coordinate system for part of the problem and XYZ coordinate system for a different part of the problem. That's fine, but don't actually change the definition for the same coordinates uh, throughout, or at least if there's a reason why you really want to, um, make it very clear. Normally, maybe part one uses one coordinate system, part two uses a different one, or each object has a different coordinate system, but you shouldn't be doing it like halfway through one calculation. Now, physics works. I mean, I guess I should just stop there. Physics works, I promise. Yay. Physics works in any valid coordinate system. And specifically, this gets back to the idea of inertial reference frames. So if you're imagining being on an accelerating car, well, now physics might not seem to work, but that's because you're not in a valid coordinate system. You're in an accelerating coordinate system. Um, the math might be impossible. And so that's one thing with using the RTZ. Using X, Y, and Z can still work, but now you have a force that's changing a direction in your X and Y coordinates. Your velocity is changing direction in your X and Y coordinates. And, and that might be an interesting math problem to do, to try to get all of your sine and cosines right. Think about you know the functional form of a circle. But I really don't think that's important, right? This is physics class and not math class. So why we use RTZ is just to simplify it. So something here is that the RTZ coordinates are moving with your object. Don't just leave uh, the coordinates in place and have your object move. They're with your object. Um, and one thing to highlight is that the RTZ coordinates, because it is with an accelerating object, it is not actually an inertial reference frame, but that's just the direction that we're expressing forces in. So what's a little bit confusing, and the book tries to clarify this, is that we're not actually pretending that we're sitting 
on our particle and doing physics, because in that case we would say our particle isn't moving, uh, we are still making measurements and observations from the lab frame. This is just the coordinate system. Please, please, please still use unit vectors to denote directions and use components with subscripts. So one way that I typically write things is like this, where you have your net force, it's a vector because it has components in three directions. And then for each of these components now, your F net comma subscript, this is a direction, is just the magnitude, right? F net R is the magnitude. And then R hat is the direction. F net T is the magnitude in the tangential direction, which is then T hat. So this is a nice consistent way to actually do your notation. You know, finally, positive and negative sides signs are for x and y we're telling you up versus down left versus right now it's going to be towards or away from the origin if we're in the radial direction um, and again the book uses a convention that's a little bit different than a lot of other sources so please make it clear at the beginning what is the positive direction for your calculation similarly for tangential that the positive direction will probably be forward uh, but that's going to be with respect to motion and maybe you have more than one thing moving so again please make sure that it's clear what is the positive direction for both the radial and tangential components